There was a guy named Andrew Snelling who was a geologist, like yourself. Uh, he was working in Australia, and he published a paper um, round about Y2K, uh, where he him, he had himself personally dated a rock formation in, bil in the billions of years. And he goes through, as you would in any peer-reviewed published scientific you know, uh, article, he went through all the details in how he ascertained these dates, all of these figures, all of these charts, everything. Okay, this is all good. This is how we know the Kungura formation is two point whatever billion years old. At the same time, that that article was being published. He also published another article to, to what would become Answers in Genesis magazine, wherein he gave no criteria for how he determined anything, but he declared that the entire fossil record and all of geohistory and all of geostrata and everything are the result of the, the worldwide flood of Noah. Is it possible for a professional geologist to know how to do all of these things that he was doing when he was publishing to peer review journals? Is it possible for somebody to, to, to hold up, to know all of this and, and to show that you, he, he's showing all the figures on how he knows all of this and other people can go back and check, and check it and get the same figures. But then he's turning around and saying this other thing that's entirely different. This is saying that the earth is only 6,000 years old. Is there any way that he could sincerely believe that the Earth is only 6,000 years old? That's a good question. I, I think like one of the things that um, maybe I, it's kind of interesting, I don't know the whole story behind it, but when you date things um, it, it's fairly expensive to date things and you have to go through the um, use basic sophisticated equipment, so you have to use a mass spectrometer have to prepare, if, especially if it's billions of years, you're probably dating zircons, so you have to use, um, back then they were probably using grinding up with zircons and getting dates and stuff, but I don't think sincerely, like if you're getting data and you, uh, one of the things that you have to be as a scientist is you have to follow the data, so if you're getting data and you're getting ratios that are giving you a certain age, you have to then explain why you're not believing them. I've done some radiometric dating and I've done some isotopic work with mass spectrometers. And one of the things that can happen um, is you come into with a hypothesis. You're like, all right, I'm going to see these ratios. I'm going to see this data. This is what I predict. And sometimes you get the data back. Um, you run it through the lab and you get the data back and they don't match at all. <laughs> and you're like, okay, something else is going on. Like, what is going on? Does that mean that the data is wrong or that you so, were wrong? So there could be two things. You, the data, you could have collected the sample incorrectly. Um, you could have analyzed the machine, could have been off. So, or you could have, you know, something could have happened. So you got contaminations or something. So oftentimes what you do is you send it to another lab and you see what they come up with. And if they come up with the same thing as the, as the first lab you sent it to or worked in, then you can, you're like, oh, they got the same thing. This must be more, more true. Um, and you might publish on it, and then somebody else says, wow, you found that result. I'm, I have, I'm gonna do the same thing with the same rocks. So I've been running a bunch of uh, samples, um, looking at chemostratigraphy sort of uh, questions, and I sent it to one lab, and I sent it to another lab here in the United States, I just actually gave a bunch of samples to Egyptian scientists. I sent it samples to China for a lab there. And so they're all running the samples. And I say, tell me what your results are so I can verify. Because the more we run these things, the more labs are running them, the more data you're collecting, the more you verify things. So we've been doing some stuff with mercury isotopes. And I got interested in mercury isotopes in part because I was verifying another scientist, a Canadian scientist who was doing mercury. And so I'm like, oh, I know somebody who does mercury, so we'll do some mercury stuff. So a lot of it's that way. That's how scientists work. We're always trying to reanalyze the samples, um, mailing out rocks to be resampled and stuff. So if you're collecting something, if you're a scientist out there collecting something, and you get a date on an ash, um, there's a number of ashes out here. There's actually a bunch of great Eocene ashes that have been dated um, 
out in these areas and scientists get super excited that someone is actually going to take another sample and get another date because the more data you have the better you get that uh, that date nailed down well what i'm hearing is minutes. that you don't ever get to just dismiss whatever the date is i mean you can go back and double check you can yeah. make sure that you got your math right somebody else is going to make sure that you got your math right but you you have to have the data support what you say you can't ever just say that something is because you want it to be <laughs> yeah and there's ash layers that people like in the eocene um like there's a the little point ash um, um has been dated by dozens of labs and it's interesting because you can see the little slight variation between each of the labs but they all settle on a very close date around 40 million years ago and what's interesting is that, is that when you get somebody who's dated a bunch of the ash and they're, they're kind of a little off than everybody else, you're like, their lab isn't as good as all these other people because they're getting all these precise numbers. When so, everybody's working independently and they come yeah. up with the same figures, well, you know, that makes sense. Yeah. But you have to wonder, what, you just have to scratch your head if this other one did the same thing independently and they're the only one who know that and everybody else what they do. We talked a little while back about what would be, what would we expect? If there was a, a worldwide flood, is you know the, the, the people who watch my channel, most of you know, I, I deal with creationists, you know, people who insist that they, they want to deny all reality, they want to deny tectonic plate movement, or they want to insist that all of the continents ran away from each other explosively at highway speeds to suddenly decelerate to their current GPS levels, right? As as if and. and <laughs> So they want to deny all of everything as necessary in order for the magic book of fables to be correct. And it talks about a worldwide flood. And it doesn't matter how much proof there is that the flood never happened. They're not going to believe it. But there are some honest people out there. So what would we expect to see? You're a geologist. You, you're a climate geologist, right? Uh, you I, have some other I'm, I'm an environmental geologist. Environmental. <laughs> yeah. okay. but, uh, um, as, <laughs> yeah, there are uh, fl floods take place all the time uh, in geologic history, and um, you can watch the news uh, over the years and see uh, flooding take place uh, due to torrential rains, due to earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and and other causes as well. But when you're talking about a global flood, um, that would le a global flood would leave behind it a global debris field so in every valley of the earth there would be the debris from that flood huge boulders um, uh, an exotic mix of uh, preserved species human bodies um, a, a worldwide mix of different fossils and remains would be mixed in with this really coarse heavy sediment and that debris deposit would be distributed through uh, topographic lows around the globe. Well, we just don't find that. Um, so because there's no uh, global flood debris deposit, there couldn't, the Noatian flood couldn't have been global in scale. If it happened, it was a regional event uh, or it was a local event, but uh, certainly not global in extent. If uh, it's supposed to have rained 40 days or 40 nights, um, well, if that happened and, and all the world's waters got mixed up in a big ugly swirl, why aren't Cape Buffalo or giraffe fossils found in North America? Well, one, because they never lived here, and two, because they were never brought here by a global flood. Why aren't American bison fossils found in Australia or Europe or, or Africa? They don't live there. They live in North America, and no flood brought them to Australia or Antarctica or other areas. So there's no um, cosmopolitan exotic mix of fossils we find in valleys around the world. Hence, no global flood. I actually heard of a, a, a site right by your hometown, Dinosaur National Monument, right? Where there's like 95 different species of dinosaurs and crocodilians and turtles and fish and other things. And it's a coastal area, even though it doesn't look like it's a coastal area, we know that there was an inland sea or that there was a lake that, that, that had existed in that area until just, just prior to that time. And all of these species, including the crocodiles and the turtles, they're all Jurassic. They're all Jurassic turtles, Jurassic crocodiles.
crocodilians and so forth. And then you'll and they're find... all North American, too. And the crocodilians are weird. They're like that big. <laughs> <laughs> really weird. Did you see those? Well, <laughs> the, the point that I want to make is, yeah, they have all of these Jurassic species. And then you'll have, in other deposits, you'll have, like in La Brea, you know, been, the, the, the creationists are saying that what, 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 what do we have, what would we expect if we saw worldwide flood? We'd see millions of dead things buried in water all over the earth, except that La Brea is in tar, and so there's now we have all of these Pleistocene animals that are buried in, and, and so we have an entire different ecosphere represented in, in these tar pits. And then we have uh, in North America, I forget where at the moment, and then we also have in Lian, Lianning province in China, we have another Pleistocene deposit from a volcanic ash fall. Again, not water. Funny, we have fossils not made of water. Not one modern thing in any of these ash falls, right? These are all Pleistocene. In China, they're all Cretaceous. Not one Jurassic species. They're all Cretaceous. There's no Pleistocene things in there either. And where are the people? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Where are the yeah. people mixed in with all of these uh, animals? One of, one of the things that you see in paleontology is, is this um, law of succession, which basically means that there is a interesting order in which you see animals in the rock layers. So if you, there was a global flood, for example, um, you would see one group of animals and then you would see an extinction point, which is the flood. You would see a change in lithology, meaning the rocks would change to marine rocks. And then you would see above that, in this, in this marine rocks, you would see the same types of fossils that you would see in North America and everywhere because everything was under the ocean. So these animal, these marine animals living under the ocean could move between continents because there was no continents. And then on top of that, you would see another layer of the animals that survived that extinction event, that flood. And so you would see a very distinct layer that you could actually correlate between continents. That's the debris deposit. That would be the disaster fauna. Yeah. And, and you don't see that. You see seaways come and go at different times. It's so like in, in uh, here in North America, where we are today, um, you would see Western Interior Seaway coming in the Cretaceous, and then there's another seaway, the Sundance Seaway, comes in in the Cretaceous, the and then the Jurassic. Yeah. And you see these seaways come and go and come and go. Um, you get back into the Paleozoic, and there's, there's a big seaway. And so you, we can't correlate from seas to seas anymore. They're different. They're at different times. And you don't see necessarily in an event that you can correlate between continents. So if there's a global flood, you would see something like the Cantina flood, because it's a uranium spike that you can tie each of the continents um, based well, on, on the geochemistry. So, yeah. But what you do see is in the mesel pits in Germany that go back to 47 million years, or here in the Badlands that go back to 47 million years, you're seeing the same. You're seeing the Eocene represented, the age of, of mammals, right? Represented in two different ways, but with, with some consistency across the board. Right? In different continents, we're still seeing the same thing. It doesn't matter where you where you are. It is where all that matters is what was the what is the exposed um, layer of strata that we're looking at. And there's a consistent story across the for everything, showing these different geologic ages. Yeah, and one of the neat, neat things about the Cenozoic that's a little bit different than especially the early Mesozoic. In the Cenozoic, the continents had split apart. So today we have this Australian fauna, the marsupials in Australia, and this unique fauna in, in South America, and they have their own histories. So there are animals like marsupials in Australia, like kangaroos, that are able to survive and do things and survive this entire Cenozoic when there were like antelope up here and artiodactyls in North America that were surviving and doing the same thing. And they are on different trajectories because there was no way for these mammals to hop between continents uh, during that period of time. So this idea of um, uh, G.G. Simpson, uh, uh, George Gaylor Simpson was a famous uh, mammal paleontologist and he called it splendid isolation. <laughs> Each of the continents were splendidly isolated and they had their own story. 
Um, and you see that each geographic place has kind of its own story of evolution of how the animals changed and adapted to the local environments and the changes that were happening to the climate locally. And, uh, you know, it's, it's incredible that, like, you know, places like Australia have just a completely different mammal fauna than places like North America. And that's because of that unique history. So, yeah, paleontology is cool. Pa paleontology you get out in the is field so and cool. Look, because you can find fossils <laughs> anywhere. You don't have to come out in the middle of nowhere to look for fossils. That's fun. But you can find fossils in road cuts. You can find fossils in your backyard. You can find fossils at the beach. You can find fossils anywhere. There was a school bus driver in my neighborhood in Texas who was a young earth creationist and thought that dinosaurs were a hoax. And then he discovered a mosasaur in, in, in the local creek at the end of my street where a rainstorm had washed away this, had eroded this little, and he could, he could see it. So I don't know how he explains that to himself. <laughs> yeah, you want to go out and find it. You don't want some Yahoo who's going to be like, I don't, I don't know, this is real, I don't know. Yeah, this was something. a hoax put here to fool me. <laughs> yeah, you want to find those things. You want to, like, discover, make these discoveries, because it's fun. I think that's one of the things I love about paleontology. Paleontology changes by each fossil discovery you find. So it, it doesn't change by people's opinions. You can have any sort of opinion you have, but once you find a fossil, it's entered in as evidence and it can change things quite dramatically. Um, you can find a fossil that's out of place or something you, new and unique, and you get to rewrite the textbook because of that fossil. So a paleontology's worth is, is basically on what types of fossils they find and, and, and bring into the field. So. And this guy finds a jaw yeah, I know. of a, of a rhino stuff. five <laughs> minutes out of the car on the first sight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a lot of fun.